This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. The way people understand what type of company you are and who you are as a businessman, it's not when things are going great, it's when things go Mm -hmm. bad. How do you solve the problem and how do you show people that you do care and you will take care of it? What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. What's up, Do It For A Living community? Hey guys, even though Kevin's taken over the main task of doing interviews, I'm going to be doing them every chance I get, so stay tuned. I appreciate everybody that's listening. Uh, I hope it's inspirational for everybody. We're going to keep grinding out interviews and growing this thing, trying to provide resources and really just help everybody out. Keep listening and uh, have a great day. So I'm here with Ravi Dolwani from CSF Radiators, a fourth generation of the CSF family of radiators, and he's the CEO of the High Performance Division. So he's actively growing his business and expanding into the performance space. Ravi, how's it going, man? Reed, it's going well, man. Another sunny day in beautiful Southern California. I can't complain, you know. Life is great. Right on. Right on. So I like to dive right in. Tell us about yourself and your business. Like, how did you get started and what's your background? Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, CSF, uh, you know, as you said, is a uh, fourth generation family business. Uh, we're cooling system manufacturers. And, uh, you know, I was kind of just born into it, obviously. And, uh, you know, after, you know, going to university and trying to decide if I wanted to join the family business or pursue some other type of career, uh, it really gave me an outlet to, uh, you know, enjoy the high performance part of the business that I decided to grow or build and then grow. And then also, you know, be able to continue the family legacy. You know, not many family businesses go for generations. So it's a unique experience that uh, I'm having right now. It's, uh, it's a great blessing to be able to work close with my father and my uncles and some of the other people who are still actively involved. You know, some of these people have all been together as a group for over 30 years. You know, that's, wow. older, than, that's older than me. So uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's very cool. So, you know, as far as what we do, um, cooling system manufacturers, we're a true manufacturer. So we actually own, operate our own factories. Uh, we do radiators, intercoolers, AC condensers. Other types of heat exchangers, including, you know, like oil coolers and power steering, anything cooling, heat transfer, that's what we do. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts. And then I am, you know, in charge of all the high performance stuff. I started the high performance division about six years ago and, uh, you know, started it from nothing. Uh, You know, it's obviously same type of stuff, different market, a little higher in the engineering, you know, construction of the products and the customer base. But, yeah, that's that's kind of what we're doing at CSF. So... You said you started the high performance division. Um, what does that look like? What is what did you have to do to get it off the ground? Um, you know, it's really when it started, it was kind of a humbling experience because I was joining a business that made cooling products. And CSF is a global manufacturer. We have OEM customers around the world. You know, guys like Isuzu, John Deere, Caterpillar, Mercedes Benz. I mean, you name it. We've we've done a lot of business with a lot of people. So I thought it would be easy. Uh, you know, just say, hey, CSF's now making all aluminum radiators and doing other <laughs> types of things like that. Just start walking into places and they would be very welcoming to this brand and this product. Uh, and that was absolutely not the case. It was definitely a humbling experience of actually starting a company from nothing. Just because, you know, the mechanic who's doing radiator replacements on who CSF is doesn't mean the guy with the race car knows who we are. So we weren't even on the radar for most people. And there was really no confidence behind the product because they only thought of us as, you know, replacement or OEM type business, not necessarily catered to the race crowd. So to get it started, it was a lot of, you know, just starting and going to shops in the local area. You know, Southern California is a great place for high performance. A lot of the companies are here. Just meeting people, networking, learning, failing, you know, (laughs) trying to do better. And you kind of just find the right people to give you a chance. You know, you learn what a distributor is, what a dealer is, and you kind of just learn from the experience and just grow the brand. And you just got to find the right products to make, and you got to go from there. I always always take it with you got to make stuff people need, not necessarily what they want. 
if you make stuff that people need and there's a use for it, you got a better chance of selling it than just something that they want because it's flashy or shiny. So we look for a lot of problem vehicles. We want to be cooling solution specialists. Car overheats at the track, wasn't built properly or engineered properly from the OEM. An upgraded cooling system might be able to help that user enjoy the experience of why he bought the vehicle. No so more. how do you, how do you communicate that to a new customer that's never done business with you? Um, you know, there's got to be a competitive advantage for someone to either switch from their current supplier. And I think CSF has a lot of those competitive advantages. Uh, you're dealing with an American company. You get very good service. You know, all my customers have direct link to me. They have a problem. They can pick up the cell phone or email me. I'll get back to them in a day. Um, you know, and then you kind of just show them why the product is better. There's better technology involved, the R&D, the engineering. Uh, you know, the build quality, the construction, how we just do everything from step A to step Z. And that, I think, is also one of the biggest difficulties is some people are closed-minded. They're happy with what they have, not maybe being open to the idea that there could be something better and a better value. Right. So right. That, that, if, it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think exactly. A lot of people, but but there's, there's better things out there. Exactly. You know, you gotta you got to be able to show somebody that, I'm calling you because I think, not just because I want to grow my business and sell, I think I can help you. You growing your business with my products will help me grow my business. I think it's really important that, that people understand that you are very interested in sell-through, right? It's not just about you sell it to them and then it sits on their shelf. Like, it needs to, to solve problems for them. And if, if uh, like, the ability for them to sell it through and for it to solve problems for their customers, that's the the thing that helps you to grow your business. Like it actually has to solve the problem. It's not the, the transaction isn't over when you, you know, made the sale to them, right? It has to then sell through and solve a problem for the end user. You're exactly right. And, uh, you know, one thing about CSF that I think is unique from other high performance companies or companies in general, we don't sell direct retail. So okay. we don't sell on our website. You can't go buy it. We really try to support the automotive distribution channels of our distributors and our dealers. So you're not having just to convince the end user to buy the product. You have to make sure your dealer is happy. He's comfortable selling the product. The confidence is there. He's not going to have any warranty issues or fitment issues. And the distributor has got to have, you know, even more confidence because he's got more at risk. He's the one stocking the product. You know, he's the one investing into the brand. Uh, so you want to make sure you have a close relationship with everybody down the line in the automotive chain and make sure the end user, the one who's actually physically using the product, you know, is having a satisfied experience and everybody along upwards is happy. And that's how you kind of grow a business. Otherwise, you know, if you're not taking care of somebody in the wheel, you know, the, the, the movement stops. So all of your business is B2B then? Yes. So what are your thoughts on B2B margin versus B2C? So, you know, if you're, if you're selling business to business, obviously the volume is probably larger, um, you know, per customer. But, uh, you know, to do that, then the margins are, are kind of reduced. So you guys made that decision, and, and that's been your business model since the beginning, is to sell uh, exclusively business to business. Yeah, that, that has. Uh, you know, that's something I really, uh, you know, took from my father. Uh, you know, when I was initially starting the high-performance business, I was like, wow, I mean, like, everybody sells online direct. Even though they have distributors and dealers, you know, you can still go on the Sony website and buy a Sony TV. Why shouldn't I do something like that? Or you can go, you know, any type of product, even high performance. But then you're kind of competing with your customer. Right. And you don't really want to do that. You want to give them the incentive to sell. And you want to make sure the margins stay high and where they should be. Otherwise, you know, at the end of the day, this is a livelihood for all of us. If someone's not making money, or the prices are starting to get slashed, or it's on eBay or Amazon, and you know they're the only ones making money, they're just going to go find the next product where they can make money. So you have to make sure everyone has that incentive to sell, and the way to do that is sell it through the distribution channel. I have very few direct dealers because I prefer to sell to distributors. Yeah, the margin is less, but I'm dealing with less customers. There's less headaches. You know, If a guy calls yeah. for tech questions, I say, well, you, know, you should contact the dealer or the shop who sold it to you because that's the value added of why we sell it through them. Yeah. You know, I don't want to have five guys doing tech support or, you know, a ton of tax issues and retail sales and, you know, all that stuff that comes along with it. My business isn't structured like that. So when you had that conversation, when you were first getting involved, were you thinking about selling direct to the consumer then? You were saying, hey, you know, everybody else is doing it. Should we do it? And you, were, you were, had mentioned something about talking to your father about it. So I'm curious, curious how that conversation went. 
Um, yeah, we, we, we did do that. Uh, you know, we, we talked about it and we kind of looked at everything and said, you know, we're growing a company within a company. We have our CSF main business, which is a lot of volume. You know, we're selling 50,000 coolers a month, but the margins are reduced. And now we have this niche division that we're going to grow within the CSF brand. So let's try to mirror the businesses and make everything kind of the same. It's almost like the Lexus and Toyota model. They run their businesses okay. the same. They're and just one's different premium. markets. Yeah, and one's premium. You know, they're selling less cars, but obviously the margins are there. It's a higher price. That's kind of what we try to structure our business as. So we didn't want to really rock the boat and be like, oh, okay, you know, CSF, the main division, doesn't do retail, but now the high performance does. There's tax implications. You got to set up a different company. You got to get more staff. We try to balance off the economies of scale for the high performance division to be able to offer the entire industry an enormous value proposition. In the performance world, what's the competitive advantage and the reason to do business with CSF over the established uh, you know, suppliers? Okay, so what, what I always try to tell people is, you know, and whether it's a private label part that I make for another company you know, as a manufacturer of cooling systems or a part that I sell as a CSF branded product through my distributors and dealers, if the CSF high performance division was a standalone company and we weren't able to use the economies of scale of our larger parent company, everything would be about three to four times the price. When people start to realize that just because my stuff is priced very ag aggressively doesn't mean it's low quality. It just means there's now a player in the market that's able to do something that nobody else can do. Right, because you guys uh, can, uh, can use the economies of scale, like you said, from the OEM division and just change the product a little bit um, to be a more premium product. And that's, that's what maybe some of the smaller companies can't do. So you get to use your size. We get to use our size. And I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, we get like three or four full 40 foot containers a day of product. You can fit about a thousand radiators, you know, between 800 and a thousand radiators on a container. Out hmm. of those thousand radiators, 200 of those are going to be high performance. Gotcha. So it's all coming in the same factory. It's all coming on the same container. It's going on the same shelves and we're just selling it to slightly different markets. So we dove, we dove right into the business side of it and, and got pretty deep. I'm going to step back a little bit, and I want to find out a little bit more about kind of you, and, and, and you're a perfect example of find out a little bit more about the family. So have, have you always been a car guy? And obviously, you, you come from a car family. Um, you know, so some people are, you know, quote, handed the keys, and some people forge their own path, you know, just because it feels right. And both of those paths are in, interesting and worth discussing. So I'm curious – Tell me about, have you always been a car guy and about the family? Like, is your family a car family? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, but it's a very subtle way we're a car family. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about my personal experience and then tie it into the family. You know, I, I, I grew up as like a Fast and Furious kid. You know, the movie came out. I just got my driver's license. I had, you know, the Honda Accord lowered with the underglow kit and the flip out <laughs> alpine screen and you know yeah. taking auto shop and installing the can intake and you know changing my dash gauges to blue and putting a push start i mean you name it all the trinkets yeah. that that was me but you know tying into the family um just because it's a family business and it's a successful family business my parents raised me to be very humble uh you know i grew up i moved to newport beach which is a very affluent area in uh, Southern California, my freshman year of high school. So it was a big adjustment. And you know, you walk into the parking lot of my high school, you have 16 year old kids with brand new Tahoes and $10,000 sound systems and every girl's got a BMW, you know, 16th birthday present. It wasn't <laughs> like that. You know, we were given used cars and you know, this is what it is. And so it was a very show off type of, you know, area where we live, but I was very humbled and grounded by my parents. They just raised me differently than what maybe other kids had. Yeah. So that, that was, I think in hindsight, it helped because I was never given the keys to anything. You know, my dad told me, he's like, listen, I'll help you. I'll support you, but you're doing it on your own, you know, and you got to really prove to yourself and everybody else in the family that you can take on this responsibility. I mean, it's a huge responsibility. And you always hear the stories about how the next generation of a family business fucks it up. Yep. And I don't want to be that guy. You know, and I got a lot of aunts and uncles and everyone kind of looks at our family business and says, you know, they've done something and been able to sustain it for four generations. And, you know, what's the next generation going to do? 
Mm -hmm. So that, that's, um, you know, it's a very, uh, humbling experience that I'm going through. It's very, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. Sometimes I do get a little bit overwhelmed thinking about, you know, my dad's in his sixties now, what's going to happen. You know, is he slowing down? Does he want to keep doing it? Uh, you know, does he, you know, what, what, what happens next? And, uh, you know, I love working with him. That's the best part about the business is I get to hang out with my dad every day and I learned so much from him. He's like my idol. He's my role model. Like he's a genius. So, right. you know, that's so rad. Yeah. And that's awesome. You know, and yeah, there's always going to be a little bit of bumping heads, old school, new school, you know, trying to teach them what Facebook and Instagram is and why we should <laughs> use it, you know, right. and you know, why it's important to get, you know, better inventory systems and stuff like that. But how do you tell a guy who sells 50,000 boxes a month that he needs to do something different? Yeah. He's, you know, so there's a little bit of a, you know, struggle, you know, we pull at each other, we butt heads sometimes at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're doing it for our family. Yeah. So I I can see that there'd be a lot of burden, um, a lot of responsibility. You know, you, you alluded to the fact that, you know, moving forward, what does 10, 15 years from now look like? Um, so when you get overwhelmed and, you know, how do you deal with being overwhelmed and, and do you ever doubt yourself? How do you deal with self doubt? I think you got to look at self-doubt as a challenge. You know, I've always taken it from, you know, adversities that's come in my life and other areas that you're going to get through it. Life will be okay. You're not going to just, you know, nothing's going to happen. Everything's going to fall apart. And then what? Like challenges will come, stay calm, stay focused and understand how do I get through the challenge? So you may get overwhelmed, but it's really kind of stepping back. And then, you know, obviously you surround yourself with good people my fiance is very, uh, you know, she's very supportive. My mother's very supportive. My sister's very supportive. You know, I have a great group of friends and other contacts in the industry where sometimes I bounce ideas and try to get an idea of what I should do next. So I, I think it's just kind of looking at the big picture from the outside perspective. Sometimes you got to step outside of yourself and understand that what's happening now, there's a lot of burden because it's in the moment. But if you look at the bigger picture, it's not that big of a deal you will be able to figure out, you will be able to overcome and you will move on and you'll learn from it and you'll be a better person because of it. Nice. Well said. Tell us something that has you fired up, something that you're doing right now that has you fired up. Uh, Right now, I'm like knee deep in the development for the F82 chassis, F8X chassis for the BMW M3 and M4. I am super excited about all the stuff that we're doing on this new platform. You know, BMW is a big market for us. Uh, we were kind of coming in middle of the game on the last generations of M3s. And now we want to be the first one out the gate with a full entire cooling package. You know, we're doing 3d scanning with some of our partners, you know, we're working with VF engineering, who's a you know, juggernaut in that side of the business. Uh, we're working with Yoast Autosport on their, you know, uh, endurance race car. It's going to be in our booth at the SEMA show with all of our cooling products. And we got five coolers coming out for this car. We got uh, a DCT transmission cooler. We have an engine oil cooler. We have the front mount heat exchanger. And, you know, we got a radiator, obviously, and we're doing the liquid to air intercooler that sits on the top of the engine bay, too. So that, that's really what I'm excited. Um, as the brand is growing, you got to keep growing the product line and the range. And now, you know, we're investing a lot of the revenue back into the R&D. And, you know, we want to challenge ourselves and make products that no one else has made, be the first one, you know, world exclusive type stuff. So that, that's really what I'm excited about right now. So did you already have relationships with VF Engineering and Yoast uh, or did you approach them cold to create those partnerships? Um, initially, you know, like with VF Engineering, I had reached out to him maybe four or five years ago. And... The way I've kind of grown the CSF brand on the high performance is I just want to work with the best people. You know, I'm very inundated into the industry. I know who's the movers and shakers. I know who the guys who have influence. I know who's making the best stuff, who's tuning the best cars. I want to be associated with those people. I want to make parts for these people. I want people to, you know, think of CSF as working with the best. CSF is the best cooling system, you know, manufacturer out there. So, yeah, I just reached out to the owner, Nick at VF, and he was uh, very, uh, you know, open-minded. I came in, you know, we talked about starting with an engine oil cooler for the uh, older E92 M3s, and it was a hit. And, uh, you know, we kind of just kept growing the relationship from there. You know, Yoast Autosport, uh, they had kind of approached me because they had seen the range of cooling products that I had made with VF, and there was a need. This is where I come back to, like, the cooling solutions. The E92 M3 has got a ton of cooling issues. 
So they need it. I mean, they're doing 25 hours of Thunderhill. You know, they're doing these endurance races in the middle of summer in California desert. You got to have a good cooling system or you can't run your car. So it was a win-win because I'm being able to validate my parts in the most extreme conditions. And I use that validation, that proven, you know, race cred to kind of sell it to the rest of the market. You know, if it's good enough for a 25 hour car, I'm pretty sure it's going to be good enough for the next guy, you know, who's doing less than they are. So that's killer. I think that's a, a really valid point, right? Is to find out who's the best and work with them, right? I mean, if it can live through that environment, you're right. It, it's uh, it's going to be just fine in in 99% of the applications where guys are, you know, weekend warriors, for example. Exactly. And you know, one thing I want to add is, uh, you know, going back to working with the parent company, we have the advantage internally that with the high performance division, we can do whatever we want. We're not living and dying by just our revenue on the high performance division. So we can yeah. grow it the right way. We can grow it organically. And, you know, if we don't want to work with someone, we don't have to work with somebody. We don't need to drop our pants. We don't need to, like, fire sell everything. You know, the lights are going to go off if we don't make our numbers this month. So it's a very interesting concept compared to everybody else. I'm selecting and choosing who I want to work with rather than having to work with people. I'm growing the brand, what I think is going to be sustainable for long-time growth. So people in 20 years definitely think of CSF as the premier cooling system manufacturer, not just in the U.S., not just in North America, but all over the world. Huh. That's a big, hairy, audacious goal, my friend. Well, you know what? I mean, there's, there are cooling system manufacturers who I look up to that I want to be like them. You know, you have CNR out of Indianapolis. They do all the NASCARs. They have a lot of good contracts with a lot of people, and they've been around for, you know, 20, 30 years, and they're proven. You have PWR out of Australia. He's doing the F1 cars. He's doing, like, the MotoGP stuff. He's got technology that, you know, blows me away sometimes when I walk by his booth at the PRI show or, you know, what I see what they're doing. So I know the owners. They're very friendly to me. You know, I kind of idolize those gentlemen as well. And I want to be like them. I want to be able to compete with those guys. You know, I'm the next generation. Uh, you know, these guys are all older. They're established. But if I can be that next guy in line who's, you know, gunning for them, you know, why not? Right. So what are you not good at? Like, what's your Achilles heel? <sighs> um, I'm very blunt. Yeah. So that's, I think that's an advantage for sure. It is. It is and it isn't. I think in the high performance market, everyone's got an ego. And yeah. sometimes you might rub some people the wrong way, and that might be something that you know hinders the progress of a relationship or it kind of – I think in the long run it helps because I put all my cards on the table. You know, like yeah. I say, like, hey, this is, this is how we are. We want to work with you. Is it a good fit? The other thing I think that is a little bit of a Achilles heel is it's really hard to delegate. You know, I hire some new staff. I tell them to do something. It's not as good as I can do it. And – are you going to be happy with the quality of work that they're doing? You know, is it is 90 percent acceptable to grow your company or is it possible to find someone who can do 100 percent of what you could do? That, that's also difficult because sometimes I give a task to somebody and they don't perform or do it the way I think that quality level is being reached. And I'm like, I'll just do it myself or I'll redo yeah. it. So that, that's tough. You know, and, you know, my dad's always told me, he's like, listen, hardest part about business, one of them is managing people. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, the operations will happen, the design, the engineering, but you got to take care of people's feelings. You got to take care of people's egos. And it, it's, it's always going to be a struggle. You know, people mess up and you have to be comfortable with that and you have to be able to work with them. Everyone's got a limitation. What are they good at? What are they bad at? So that, that I think is something I'm still trying to figure out. And I think the only way you learn that is from experience. Word. Robbie, give us just a second. We're going to take a break right now and pay the bills. So Let's we will it. be right back. EFI University is hosting a new class called Essentials of Operating a Shop. If you're interested in learning how to run your shop more efficiently, this class is for you. For details and to find a class near you, go to EFI101.com and look for the Essentials of Operating a Shop class. Our next class is being held in Denver, Colorado on July 16th, followed by Charlotte, North Carolina on July 23rd. Be sure to use the coupon code DIFAL for $50 off when you sign up. All right, so we're back. So, look, I want to dive into something that's deep, right? And I want people to be able to relate to kind of you and what you're doing. And specifically, we've all had a bad situation, right? We've all, we all have, you know, that one moment that where we were flat on the floor, like dead on our face. So can you explain the worst 
experience that you've had in your career? I've had a lot of bad experiences. <laughs> so now I'm like jogging through my mind and saying, you know, what, what was the worst? Um, you know, you make a part, the shipment's there, and you realize it's built wrong. And now it's like damage control. You know, yeah. uh, you know it's like two millimeters off. But now the fitting on the oil cooler is leaking fluid. And you got 75 pieces sitting on your dock. You realize the problem. And the customer needed it yesterday. He's got pre-orders. How do you fix it? You know, so we've had a couple of those. We've kind of had to eat some shipments. I sent a shipment to a private label customer. He wasn't happy with it. I ate 100 intercoolers. But, you know, I had to air freight it. Two weeks later, he's like, man, you fixed the problem. And we're really happy with what you did. This new stuff is awesome. And, uh, you know, I, one other thing my dad's always taught me, he's like, the way people understand what type of company you are and who you are as a businessman, it's not when things are going great, it's when things go mm -hmm. bad. How do you solve the problem and how do you show people that you do care and you will take care of it? Um, you know, the other things, I think what worst experience is not getting paid, getting stiffed by companies you've approached because you like them, you idolize them, and then you make them radiators and they just don't pay you. I'm, call, I'm calling out D3 Cadillac. That guy still owes me 5,000 bucks. So, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I went over there, made him a bunch of CTSV radiators, you know, put his name on it, co-branded it. Awesome shipment, great product. You know, I'm still waiting for my money. Got a collection guy trying to, you know, suck 500 bucks out of him every month. So, you know, it sucks because you look up to these guys, you have a great relationship, everything's great until it's time, time to pay. Um, you know, getting paid is one of the hardest things in this business. Um, a lot of high performance guys are good at what they do, but they don't know how to manage their books. It's like the last thing on their mind. Either they're so busy, they let payments go. And you know, I mean, we're just too busy to chase down money owed to us. So we rather do business with companies that pay on time. And if you don't pay on time, we cut you off, you know, and yeah. that, that's, it's, 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 it's tough because we like these people. We enjoy doing business with some of these people, but we got to get paid. You know, I'm not the bank of CSF. You know, yeah. we got to keep our factories running. We got to keep the lights on. We, we got, you know, it's still at the end of the day, it's a family run company and we run it like a small business. So that's, uh, you know, those are some of the challenges that we've had in the past. And it's, I think, you know, it's all about trying to make it right. I think it's a real valid point when you talk about, um, you know, kind of eating the situation where maybe something didn't fit exactly right. Um, uh, because it's, it's all about like a long-term relationship as opposed to a short-term relationship, because it's not just about the, whatever, you know, $5,000 or $10,000, you know, the here and now it's about, you know, you want to do business with that company for, you know, 10, 20 years. Right. And, and if you, if you man up and, you know, own that situation, you've just shown your colors. Right. And so now that person, that customer knows, like you said, and like your dad said, the type of business and the type of person that you are. So they know what to expect from you moving forward, you know, and it's all about, I just really respect that um, long-term outlook over the short-term outlook that I think, uh, you know, a lot of people have a short-term outlook. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, another lesson from my dad, he's like, listen, lose the order. Don't lose the customer. Yeah. You know, he's like, you'll make it back. If you, if you, if you take care of them, they're going to be happy. They're going to have more confidence in you. They're going to understand that you can deliver what they expected and there'll be more business. And I'll give you a case in point, that company where I ate the hundred intercoolers, three more projects are in the works right now with them because right. they saw how we were able to quickly react and fix the problem. And that's, that's really what about, you know, it's like, it's manufacturing at the end of the day, there are going to be problems. You know, there is a warranty and defect rate for any product in the world. We're making 50,000 coolers a month. Not all of them are going to be perfect. You know, yeah. sometimes someone messed up down the chain, whether it's an engineer, whether it's a product QC guy, you know, whether it was a welder, it's, it's, it's tough to catch all the mistakes. So when there are mistakes, we got to rectify them as quickly as possible. And, you know, it's always about keeping the customer happy. Word. Robbie, give us just a second. We're going to take a break right now and pay the bills. So Let's we will it. be right back. All right. So we're back. Ravi, why do you think that you've been successful when other people haven't been? And we kind of touched on this a little bit with the fact that you guys have, um, you know, you're not living and dying by, you know, the performance brand, you know, having to keep the lights on, for example, right? So that, that's, you kind of touched on a little bit, but can you expand on why you, you've been able to be successful, um, you know, when other people maybe haven't been? Because what we're talking about is, you know, the, the entrepreneurial type mindset, right? Where there's a lot of people, people that are listening to this are, are guys trying to start shops and trying to start businesses. So, you know, they're looking for advice. They're looking for things that work. 
you know? So what can you feed them in that, that regard? I mean, there, there's a few things on, you know, everyone gets to success differently. I think for me, one of the big things was just hard work. I was going to outwork everybody. You know, I, when I first started this, I was doing the 16, 18 hours days, sleeping at my office, you know, wearing the same clothes <laughs> the next morning. I mean, and, you know, both my parents, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, she was like, your quality of life sucks. Like you, all you do is work. It doesn't matter what type of money you're making or not. Like you're not enjoying life. You're always on your phone. You're checking emails. You're taking care of people's problems. And sometimes you got to do a couple of those years to get to where you want to be. You know, like there's not, I always feel like there's not enough hours in the day. And it's just about prioritizing, doing what's really important and just kind of having a checklist. I walk around with a checklist all day and I learned this from my father. He sits around with like a little notepad and just checks off everything that he has to do and you know you'll you'll get it done eventually and um i think the other thing it's 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 hard work and because it's a family business i have the attitude that i cannot fail like yeah. there is no choice for me like there is no other career for me to get into because this is all i know yeah so i have so to it make has it work. to it has to work it has to. and yeah. it will work you know i have that mentality that this business, no matter what the landscape of it is, how it changes, you know, what markets we're, you know, in, is it, you know, replacement, is it high performance, are we going to do industrial and agricultural, are we can do more OEM, it will work, we will figure it out, we will sell cooling systems as long as I'm alive. So, you know, I think that attitude of you can't fail, not a lot of people have that. So when a guy clocks in like he's a manager of a competitor, it's his job, it's not his life. So it's your life. Yeah, it's life, man. Like, I, my life is CSF. Yeah, there are other components of my life, you know, my family, my, you know, my fiance, uh, my friends, you know, helping other, uh, you know, things I have that are going on. But at the end of the day, this is a livelihood for me. It's going to be a livelihood for my family. It's a livelihood for my parents. And, um, you know, we want, we have something really special and we want to make sure we can preserve this. I hope one day to have a son or daughter who wants to do this as well and to be able to keep passing it on to the next generation. You know, I'm just taking care of something. I'm just not, you know, I'm just, it's what we have. It's what we do. So, Ravi, if you could get back, go back in time and get a do-over for just one situation in your business, what would it be? I got some customers that come to me for like, you know, RFQs, requests for quotes, private label guys, and they were big companies. And I wanted to get my foot in the door, but I got a little cocky on the price that I quoted them. <laughs> And they kind of walked away from the deal. You know, mm. I, I, I marked it up versus my cost to what I was selling them. I was like, yo, I make some really good stuff. They should be paid for it. I know they're going to sell it for a super high price. So why not me make a lot of money on this too? And I've had a couple of those deals where, you know, I kind of just, I lost the business and it's pretty much all my fault. I knew my quality, the perfect, like they were looking at me to do the business for them, but I kind of just, you know, it was my fault why I didn't get the business. So that's, that's, it's a, it's a humiliating experience almost, you know, internally for me. It's like, man, I had this business. I just lost it. It's like one of the best customers in the country. I really wanted to work with these guys. I blew it because I was getting cocky and I was getting maybe a little too greedy. And, you know, so you live and learn, you know, they'll come around again. Some of them have, you know, and the next time yeah. I'll, I'll get the deal. So. So just before we jump into quick answer questions, we're gonna take one more quick break. Uh, I got to pay the bills. We'll be right back. Before we continue on, I wanted to take a second and tell everyone about my shop assist. If you own or work for a performance shop of any type, such as installation shops, tuning, engine, transmission, or even custom fabrication, take some time and think about how organized and efficient your operation is. Our goal at Do It For A Living is to tell success stories on the industry and educate you, the listener, on how to be successful in your business. My shop assist was developed for this very reason and helps to address many of the most common shortcomings at shops. With my shop assist being cloud-based, you have access to your data from anywhere. You will have a built-in calendar, track tasks and parts on every job you have, track time, document your work with notes and pictures, as well as files such as tuning files and data logs, individualized task lists for texts and reports to measure their efficiency. Jobs can be exported to QuickBooks for accounting. So MSA was designed to be simple to use and will help anyone from a one-man shop up to the top performing shops in our industry. Check out the system for free at www.myshopassist.com. So we're going to jump into quick answer questions. Um, so I'm going to fire these things off at you and just fire right back. Fair enough? Let's do it. What software program are you using daily? Are you using anything for like 
like you said, prioritizing, or um, it could be even engineering software, CAD modeling. Like, what what software are you using that uh, that you know people that are listening to this might might not be aware of or might not know how to use it? You know, we, uh, yeah, for needed. sure. We we use an inventory system called Maxell. That's what CSF runs on. Uh, it's a little bit of an outdated system, but you know that's what we use. So uh, that's one program. Uh, you know, I'm on Excel all the time. I'm still doing it. You know, maybe it's the old school way, but we do a lot of spreadsheets, price lists, you know, graphs, all that stuff as we run our business and kind of manage, you know, databases, those types of deals. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as the engineering side, we're in CAD, we're in SolidWorks. Uh, you know, just trying to kind of one one thing I'm trying to help with my father is, you know, let's let's update our technology because as we grow our business into the new generation, if we can update the technology and move faster and better and more efficient, it's going to help our business overall. So, you know, those are some of the programs that we use. Um, a lot of emails. Excel. Yeah. Excel is just where it's at. It's so funny. Like everybody goes back to Excel. Like everybody is using Excel in some level or, or another, you know, Excel is just where it's at. <laughs> how, how, how much of an Excel ninja are you? you know, <laughs> Scale of one to 10. Um, I used to be like an eight and now I would say like I'm a six. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you why. It's, you know, when I went to university, we had to be certified as a specialist in Excel for the business school. So okay. we had to take an Excel course when you were a freshman just to be able to get into the business school. So I had, you know, I used to know how to do all the different formulas and tables and graphs and had to remember all, memorize all that. But it's kind of one of those things, if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, I don't need to go that advanced into all that stuff. But sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I could make that super cool graph that I used to know how to do. And, yeah. you know, I can't do it. Or I wish I could just populate this entire field. Don't remember how. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, Excel, Excel is an awesome tool. There's so much stuff that people don't realize that you can do with the program. And yeah. they also keep on, you know, uh, you know, moving the wheel and making it better. And I'm just not keeping up on it. I just kind of use it for, you know, no, I wouldn't say basic or stuff, but, you know, I'm in the middle. So yeah. I'm pretty good at Excel. I know people who are better than me, and I know people who are way worse. So I would guess, you know, I'm in the above average side. <laughs> yeah. Excel, I'm telling you, it, it's – uh, yeah, I'm geeking out here a little bit about mm -hmm. Excel. But uh, the, the more I learn about Excel, the more that I have people on my team that can, you know, do things with Excel, the more I realize that pretty much it can do everything that, that – all these other little software programs can do like a piece of and Excel could do it all. Just maybe it's, you know, a little requires some high level of understanding of how to do it, but uh, it can pretty much do anything. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I just use it for like, even just the easiest stuff. It's so, it's so necessary. Like, Hey, I want to track my sales for my entire company every month. I just put a number. There's a nice graph, how much money we made, how much money we lost. You know, it's all there. You can run your balance sheets. I mean, once you kind of figure out the formulas and do everything, it's an easy tool. We all know how to use it. When I send a guy an Excel file, he has Excel. It's not like, oh, I don't have right. that program, you know? So it's like yeah. universally accepted, and yeah. I don't think it's going anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we just geeked out about Excel yeah. for like three straight minutes. So. I think that's, uh, I think that's the <laughs> only conversation I'll have for a while about how great Excel is. But, hey, everyone knows it, so they're all geeking out too. There you go. So how about an app? You got a favorite app? I had one guy, a uh, friend of mine, tell me uh, Dunkin' Donuts app. That's the app. So uh, can you one-up? the favorite app what's the favorite app that you use every day um you know I, there's a lot of finance apps that i use you know whether it's a yeah. stock app or venmo you know i think venmo is an awesome tool you gotta pay somebody boom you know here's 50 bucks you know not like i gotta go to the bank or do something um you know I love so i've heard of venmo but i don't use it so what's venmo all about venmo is just sending money through your phone it's attached to either a bank account or a credit or debit card and you can just send somebody money so you know you go out to dinner with you know some friends and the bill comes and they're like, Oh, we don't do split checks. All right, fine. One guy pays. Everyone's like, all right, send them a request. Everyone pays their share and it's there. And you got a little balance in there too, you know, like, so you can okay. have money in your Venmo account. Obviously I use all the social media apps for running the business in my personal life, loving Snapchat right now. You know, I think that's yeah. definitely a game changer. Um, you know, I was at a party last night, old uh, friend from college that I had connected with. She's uh, she's working at Snapchat. And it was just awesome just kind of getting the insight on, you know, how that's going, how they're growing so much. And, you know, she's in that space. She came from SoundCloud. So just to kind of understand a little bit more, I have a lot of friends in tech. You know, I got friends who work at Apple who are in their, uh, you know, product development side. One of my cousins, the international developer for Lyft, you know, so competing okay, with Uber. Yeah. You know, I, I love those apps, man. I mean – why even get into a taxi? Why even think about drinking and driving, man? Just use a ride. It's going to be there in two minutes. 
don't have to pull any money out, just taken out of the account. So yeah, those things are great. You know, the weather app, traveling a lot. What do I pack? You know, so I mean, talk to me about Snapchat. How's that going to be a game changer? Um, I'll give you, I'll give you an example, you know, for a business, uh, or you're running a media page, you know, when social media first came out, Facebook was the deal. And then Instagram kind of took over because it was like, Hey, we're just showing you pictures. And it kind of cut out the clutter of all the other stuff that people post, you know, articles, documents, whatever. Snapchat is, Hey, this is what's going on. You're going to see it move on to the next thing. So it's video or pictures. Whereas, you know, Instagram was mostly just the pictures. Um, I have a friend, her name is Elizabeth white. She owns a channel called it's white noise. She will give her username and password to car guys all around the world. And she'll be like, Hey, your window is this three hours on this day. You're going to be at this cool event. Why don't you uh, take some coverage? So a couple of weeks ago we did Beamer Fest West and she gave me her username and password. And I just covered Beamer Fest West for three hours. Then the next guy was in Sweden on some like supercar rally. So you're able to see coverage from around the world on some of these larger channels that are very specific. Like this one's, you know, catered to the automotive world and it's awesome. You know, where else would you be able to get live coverage of all these events going on on the same day, you know, from different people and their experience. You know, now you, and you know, the girl that I uh, was talking to last night, she's on the advertisement side. You got big companies, you know, like Time, People, Vice Magazine, uh, you know, Food Network. They have their own channels, you know, and there's some ads sprinkled in there. And I, I think, I think it's definitely something that's growing and it's, it's pretty cool. I like it a lot. You know, I got some friends in our industry who use it so we can connect more on a personal basis. Like, yeah, they're customers, but I can kind of see what's going on in his real life too. I mean, one example is like uh, Alex from Sheepy Built. You know, he's one of my good boys. Yeah, we do business together, but I can see him hanging out with his kids or, you know, in the gym or playing with his, you know, with his car, with all that stuff. I mean, it's awesome. You know, I understand him more on a friendship level because of this yeah. connection that you can have to people through social media. So you're talking about uh, on Snapchat, aren't the videos, uh, you know, limited to, you know, a short period of time. So when you're, when you're taking over this Elizabeth White uh, mm -hmm. person's channel, right, and you're covering an event, um, are you just doing, uh, you know, a bunch of these short video clips or are you doing like Snapchat stories? Um, yeah, so, you know, it's all populated onto her story, but you're right. They're all like 15 second, you know, Snapchat. So I'd be doing a video and like, hey, check out this car or hey, let's have an interview with this person from this company. Um, you know, and you kind of just keep cycling it. So when a guy's watching it, he'll just go to the next one and it's just continuous coverage of one event. You know, here's 15 pictures of 15 cool cars from Beamer Fast, and it's picture, picture, picture. Here's a video, and it kind of goes like that. Gotcha. So on Snapchat, are you using it um, just personally, or does, like, CSF Radiators have a, a Snapchat? Um, I use it personally. I also cover some of my business through my personal account. Um, and then, you know, I work with other companies and take over their Snapchats. Uh, I'm thinking about having a CSF Snapchat, but you know, one thing, the double side of the coin on all the social media, it's a lot of time and work. Like I'm trying yeah. to run a business, you know what I'm saying? Like I can't be on Instagram all day. Like my company doesn't have like a dedicated social media person who just sits there all day and, you know, is on Facebook and doing ads every two hours and posts. Like it's just too much. And I just do what I can. Uh, if people like it, they'll continue to want it. And I don't want to like overwhelm people and spam them like here is 20 pictures from csf here's a bunch of videos you know and then people yeah, get over right. it so it's just just if it's just garbage then you yeah. know that's no good so yeah you know gotcha. it's, it's an important part of business i think that's a great way to connect with uh your consumer base but it's not the most important part of business what's the most important part of business making, relationship relationship and making good stuff you know yeah um i'll give you an example this is actually a great lesson that i learned from somebody uh, Griffin Radiator, you know, they're, they're a big, well-known company, you know, domestic-based. Uh, my father was very good friends with Buddy Griffin, who was the original owner of Griffin Radiator. And I remember I was in Vegas for a weekend hanging out with friends, and my dad calls me and he goes, hey, Buddy's in Vegas. You should go have breakfast with him and just kind of talk to him. And, you know, Buddy is like 70 years old at this time. He's out of the business. He sold his company. And I remember he gave me a lesson I'll never forget. He goes, you got to have good product, but touching on what you just said, people do business with you if they like you. If they don't like you, it doesn't matter how good the product is. They're not going to do business with you. So the relationship <laughs> is 
very, very, it's very, very important. You know, it's like the centerpiece of any business is how well do you communicate with your customers? How do you engage with them? You know, that whole relationship building. So I don't think of any of my customers as customers or like I'm not a vendor. We're partners. You know, I want to be yeah. friends with these people. Like I'm going to be in this business for the rest of my life. I want to be able to sit down with some of my best, you know, dealers or private label customers, you know, 20 years from now and like kind of reminisce about how well we've done and what we've grown and what we are doing. Um, yeah. How do you draw the line between like, you know, what things get shown and, and, you know, kind of your professional face versus your, you know, personal face? Like, um, how do you, how do you draw that line? How, how blurry is that line? Uh, it's super blurry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, my friends who know me, uh, you know, they think I'm kind of wild. Uh, you know, I, I get pretty silly. Um, I don't take life, you know, life is so serious because of what I do. I try not to take it too seriously. So I let my hair down, you know, as you would say, uh, you know, they see me on the weekends, you know, getting loose in the club and, you know, being outlandish and foolish. Um, it's just what I do. I am who I am, but you know, I run a successful business and we make good stuff. I can separate being at work and I can separate having a good time. You're just going to see all of it. Um, so yeah, it, it is, you know, it's a very blurry line, but you know, <laughs> that's just, that's, that's who I am. I put everything on the table. I don't hide anything from anybody. If I want to show it to my world, to my friends or whatever, my customers see it, let it be what it is. You know, funny story is I used to be a professional DJ. That's kind of how, okay. uh, you know, from high school into university. And then even after that, I was DJing all the time, like, you know, booked two, three times a week, you know, clubs, pool parties, the whole deal. So, you know, I've had customers say, hey, man, saw, saw that DJ page that you still have on Facebook, you know. So it, it does, it does sometimes maybe have a customer perception that this guy's not that serious, but I let my business etiquette and my product speak for themselves. Okay. So you don't think that that's a negative impact to say a new customer that's maybe old school, right? And he's looking at it, looking at you and testing the water and trying to see like, do you think you don't let that uh, worry you or bother you? Um, well, yeah, it's a worry, but I don't think I'm doing anything so crazy, you know, yeah. that they'd be like, oh, we don't want to do business with this guy. I mean, and going back to it, like we have a separate Facebook account for CSF, you know, we have a separate Facebook account for Instagram. So you don't see my personal stuff on that. Sure. Uh, you know, Snapchat, maybe a little bit different story. I only have a few friends who are in the business. Uh, that stuff, you know, it's gone in 15 seconds anyways, or over the next yeah, day. And, so it's not like, and it's a know. little, it's a little younger anyway. Yeah. It's a little younger. And, at least uh, right now. Yeah, exactly. And you know, one thing about social media as far as, and I, you know, it's kind of going off on a tangent, but about it, I think the industry for high performance, they don't understand that this whole thing is going to be swept under the rug from them. It's all free right now. One day it's not going to be free. And people haven't budgeted their entire marketing scheme because it's free. Hmm. You know, you got these companies that got 75,000, 100,000, you know, 2 million people following their Instagram page. You know, Instagram is owned by Facebook. Facebook sells ads. You know, everything's changed on there. Wait till the day where Instagram goes, hey, you got 2 million people. If you want them to see your photos, it's going to cost you 100 bucks a week. Yeah. You know, like it's going to happen. It's going to happen on all these social medias. And, you know, I think technology will just keep up with it. People will just jump to the next thing that is free. But I think it's going to be a shakeout soon. And, you know, talking to my friends in tech, I mean, they're all running companies. I got thousands of employees. It's all about making money. You know, at the end of the day, that's what they do. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, yeah. You know, and, and another thing, Reed, I think it's, uh, you know, as a younger guy, like I'm under 30 years old, um, our high performance business is become uh, two sides. You got the old school guys and you got the new school guys. I'm really trying to form relationships with guys that are my age, you know, early 30s, mid 30s, you know, 40s and younger because we want to be the old guys. We want our own yeah. group, our own, you know, old guy circle in 20 years. So I'm having a really, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a really good time um, with the products and relationships that I've developed with some of the younger guys in the business. I mean, I can give you some names. I mean, obviously Alex at Sheepy Built is a great customer of mine. He's a homie. Um, Ryan at Rywire, um, another great guy. We do great products together. Always, you know, working with each other, bouncing ideas. You know, we go PRI show. We stay in the same hotel room. Uh, Oscar Jackson Jr. from Jackson Racing. Uh, you know, we got dedicated motorsports out in Texas. Got the fastest GTRs in the country right now. All these guys are younger guys that, you know, when I meet with them and we shake hands, you know, there's, there's a bond there. We're like, we're going to do something special and we're going to do it for a long time. Word. That's awesome. 
and, and you know, going with that, sometimes the older guys, they give you like the big fuck you, you know, you're not, you're not welcome in our club. Yeah. You know, like well, well, we're, we're doing our own thing. you you guys are on the outside. So we got to, got to, we have to form our own club. Dude, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm going to kind of wrap this thing up and I got just a couple of last questions for you. For sure, man. Um, let, let's do it. So what's the future of automotive performance? You've touched, touched on it a little bit. Do you think it's, um, you know, electric, hybrid, direct injection, smaller turbocharged engines, and, and how does uh, CSF fit into that? Um, I definitely think you're seeing smaller displacement turbocharged vehicles. You know, you have EPA laws, uh, stringent, you know, emission laws, all that stuff, miles per gallon. So the way to get better efficiency is everything's going turboed. It's great for us because that means there's an intercooler on all these cars. It's just another yeah. product for us to make. It's on the high performance side. It's uh, you know it's an easy product to get more power. So it's a very easy bolt-on um, item that most guys will go to first. Uh, so that that's awesome for us. You know, on the main division side, it's another crash replacement part. It's in the front of a car. A guy gets in a fender bender front. Now he's got to replace the intercooler also. So that's, uh, you know, not, and then what else do I think? I mean, with all these electric cars, most people don't know. There's, there's actually more coolers on these cars than a normal vehicle. Uh, for all these, like, hybrids, there's an inverter cooler that cools the battery. That's another cooler that we're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm kind of working with a company that's trying to tune Teslas. And one of the things about Tesla is the battery overheats. That seems to be one of the limitations for these vehicles. So, you know, that I think is gonna be interesting. I'm not super convinced about the entire electric car wave versus, you know, uh, just normal engines, gasoline, the whole deal. But it's, you know, we're on the sideline, we're looking at all of it. Uh, I'm just, I love the gears, I love the smell of gas, so I, maybe I'm a little biased. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that's interesting. Um, Definitely more coolers on all these cars. As they get more sophisticated, you're seeing a lot more liquid-to-air intercoolers versus just air-to-air. -air. So we're just starting developing some of that stuff. Uh, yeah, so th those are some of the items. Cool. All right, and how do we connect with you? Uh, like, what's your Snapchat, or how do we get? How does how do people get in touch with with Ravi and CSF? Uh, yeah, sure. So you know, um, our website it's csfrace.com. Uh, you know, you want to check us on Instagram. That's a great way to connect with us. You can DM us and, you know, send us messages. It's CSF underscore radiators. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook. Uh, you know, I don't really want to give out my personal Snapchat because, you know, that might, that might come to bite me in the ass as we talked about earlier, right? So, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but, yeah, you know, there's, there's ways to connect with us, you know. Um, we, uh, you can always call us. If you want to talk to us, you know, you can either get a hold of me or, you know, one of my guys on my sales team. You know, we're always, uh, you know, we have the time. We'll definitely try to take the call and, you know, talk shop. So, and that's, that's about it. Robbie, hey, man, I really appreciate you taking some time and uh, kind of letting us into your world. I really appreciate it too, Reed. Uh, you know, this was an awesome experience. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I'm very uh, humbled to be, you know, a guest on your show. I've definitely enjoyed uh, all the other interviews that I've listened to, and hopefully this will be uh, another one that will be uh, up there. Right. I definitely think there's some good stuff in this one, So, and I, I'm sure that you've been able to help some people out, give some people some inspiration. So uh, uh, muchas gracias, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Definitely, man. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Peace. Thanks for listening to Do It For A Living. You can find out more about this guest, this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website, doitforaliving.net. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash doitforaliving and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone.